What I want to do is share with you a story. A colleague, as they often do, has shared a link with me about a story. And, and I wanted to talk about this with you tonight. And the story actually triggered an emotional response in me. I immediately, when I read it, had a knot in my stomach, tears, and just really a general state of despair. And this story could have been really about any of us present tonight or someone we love deeply. So the story I want to share with you is about Kira Johnson. Now, many of you may be familiar with this story, but Kira was a 39-year-old female. She was pregnant with her second son, and Kira really was a picture of health. She had an uncomplicated pregnancy. She ran marathons, spoke five languages, had her pilot license, and really was on top of the world. But the thing about Kira's story is, when Kira delivered her second son after she delivered him, Kira bled intra-abdominally about 3.5 liters. And just for a frame of reference, the average circulating blood volume is about five liters. So essentially, Kira bled to death after her second son. Now, in her husband's own words, Charles Johnson, he stated, we went into the hospital for what should have been the happiest day of our life, and we walked straight into a nightmare. The challenge here is that Kira's story is not so uncommon. And what I'd like to do is share with you some statistics to support the fact that, unfortunately, there are a lot of Kira Johnsons out there. So what I'd like to share with you first is when you look at pregnancy-related deaths, there are three things that stand out. First of all, of the women that are dying pregnancy, from pregnancy-related deaths, 50%, that's more than half, are dying after they deliver their babies. And this was the case in Kira's situation. Secondly, I would like to say, and what you can see on the slide before you, is some of the common causes of death throughout this pregnancy or pregnancies with women include hemorrhage, which is excessive blood loss, which of course was the case with Kira, but also heart-related conditions, which range from high blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, chest pain, a whole gamut of things. But then the final thing to note when looking at this particular slide is that women are dying up to one year after they deliver their babies, up to one year, that's 12%. So let's look at some other statistics. When you look at this particular graph, it's important to note a few things. One of them is the fact that year over year, the increase in pregnancy-related deaths are statistically significant. So this is an ongoing problem. But secondly, the thing to look at, if you look at the first set of bar graphs, the total number for the US population is 32.9% for maternal deaths. This is 10 times higher than other countries that are similar to the United States from a socioeconomic comparator lens. So this is a big number, you all. The last thing I'd like to mention about this particular slide, sad but true, when you look at non-Hispanic black women, they are two to three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related deaths in comparison to non-Hispanic white women. So let's go to this next slide. So when you look at pregnancy-related deaths by age, and you can see the numbers there in the book, they're quite alarming, but when you look at women 40 and above, they are six to eight times more likely to die from pregnancy-related deaths in comparison to women under the age of 25. Now, when you look at these disparities by both age and when you look at non-Hispanic black women, there is a concept out in the literature that talks about the weathering hypothesis. Some of you may be familiar with that, but basically what that states is that this chronic exposure, chronic exposure to social and economic disadvantage leads to a decline over time in physical health outcomes. 
Okay, so this may explain some of the differences we see when we talk about maternal health, but this is common also across the gamut in other health conditions. So how did we get here? I wanna talk about three things here. So first of all, we have to acknowledge the fact of the historical exclusion from women in research and clinical trials. You might think, oh, why is that important? Well, it's important because I tell you, there's a great quote in a book that I highly recommend that all of you read by Anousheh Hussain, and it is The Pain Gap. And in that book, it states, we know less about every aspect of the female biology in comparison to male biology. So how does that show up in the healthcare world? For one, for women, women are often diagnosed much later for comparable conditions that men have. We're diagnosed later. The other piece of that is while women live longer lives, on average, oftentimes their unhealthy years start much sooner than with men. And much of this is related to the fact that oftentimes, and for the women present, you've probably heard of this, and for the men present, you've probably heard your wives or, or spouses or partners talk about this, or women in your family. Oftentimes, women are diagnosed with undetermined, undetermined diagnoses that include things like fibromyalgia, psychosocial distress, chronic fatigue syndrome, and if you happen to be over 50, that might include me, if you happen to be over 50, menopause is a common blame for many symptoms. So it's all these container blanket diagnoses with no specific underlying diagnoses to treat. Next, I'd like to talk about social determinants of health. Now you can read the definition, but what is important to note about these social determinants of health these social drivers of health, is that they impact our ability, 50 to 80%, they impact our ability to obtain our optimal health outcomes. These are really important factors. And on this next slide, you can see the breakdown of what some of these social drivers are. But the key here is that 80% of our health and our well-being is related to environmental factors, behaviors, decisions we make, choices we make, and also social and economic factors, as opposed to the 20% that we often experience in healthcare settings. So next and final, I would be remiss tonight if I did not talk about why, how we got here if I didn't talk about communication. It is key, and how patients connect this to their quality of care, and how it actually is part of their quality of care. If you were to talk to Kira Johnson and her husband, her husband would state that communication was an issue. Kira and her husband pleaded with healthcare workers for more than 10 hours after she delivered her baby. Charles Johnson, her husband, could see that his wife, the love of his life, was showing major signs of decline, but no one would listen. Communication was a factor. So how do you address this issue? Remember that these are some very high level systematic ways to look at it, but it's not the only way. But I would first like to talk about regulatory requirements. And many of you are probably familiar with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. It's a federal agency, right? They, they oversee Medicaid, they oversee Medicare, they oversee the Children's Health Insurance Program, which is called CHIP. So here's the thing, what they are saying and some other regulatory entities that beginning January 1 of 2024, that all healthcare facilities that receive federal funding and that are accredited must start screening patients for these social determinants of health and, and connecting individuals to resources in the community if they have positive screens. It's a heavy, heavy lift, but it's a move in the right, the right direction. The second thing of note is Medicaid coverage. For many women who are underinsured or uninsured, typically these women qualify for Medicaid coverage for their pregnancy. The challenge in many of our states in this space is the fact that this coverage only lasts for two months, two months after women deliver their babies. We've already established earlier that women are dying up to one year 
postpartum after delivering their babies. So at the very least, this coverage has to be for one year after women have their babies. And in the state of Kentucky, I will say that we are not one of those states. We, we, we go for 12 months, and that's very positive. Last but not least, legislation and policy. That's very critical. So on this next slide, take a picture, look at these things, look into these various and sundry acts on maternal health and legislation. But I wanted to point out the Kira Johnson Act. Now, this is the act that Kira's husband, Charles Johnson, has been advocating for since her death. And what's really unique about this is this act is saying it's to prevent and to end, I would say, um, maternal deaths that are preventable. I don't know if you know, but more than 700 women die annually of pregnancy-related deaths, and 60%, 60% are preventable. So this is what Charles Johnson is advocating for through the Kara Johnson Act. So what are we doing? I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the place that I go to every day to work. Uh, what are we doing at UK Healthcare, the academic medical center here in Lexington, Kentucky? Well, three things, and this is not exhaustive, but three things. One, we have a long-standing partnership with the March of Dimes. And as you know, the March of Dimes is about healthy moms, strong babies. We support that mission um, through fundraising and several other ways. Secondly, we're also looking at implicit bias education for all healthcare workers, but particularly focusing on access to this information for people who care for moms and babies. And last but not least, we're also exploring technology to do real-time, real-time detection of blood loss with deliveries, because we firmly believe that no woman should be dying of something that can be detectable and preventable, such as Kira Johnson's story. So what is my hope for the future? You are our superpower, or you are your superpower. All women matter. I may not know all of you. I know a few of you. I know my mother and my aunt are in the back. But, uh, but I will say that I am advocating for you. So how do we move forward together? It's through getting involved. So you can see the March of Dimes website there, but you can also see Anusha Hussein's book, The Pain Gap. I highly recommend it for all people. And I would also like to say that if I had to give you three or four takeaways from tonight. This, this conversation and this overview is not to make you disappointed or despaired, but it's to encourage you and inspire you, but also create an awareness, right, in this space, especially in such a wonderful country that we live in. But there's a challenge around maternal health and maternal health outcomes. And so three things, self-educate, self-advocate, but also have a birth plan. And if you're not of childbearing years, certainly encourage these things for the people that you love. And finally, I would say that the literature is very, very, very strong in the powerful impact of doulas. Doulas are professionally trained individuals who can coach, support, and guide women and their families through childbirth and following childbirth. So remember, you are your superpower. And while we need help from everyone to look at this crisis in the United States, we also must do our part. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your staying power. Thank you for this space to share with you this evening and go forth and do great things.